Stacy said. Anybody else want to ask those? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah. we do. Okay. All right. We need three different people to read. Three different people. Yeah. Not the same person every time. Let's mix it up some here. Yeah. How many of you think Steve should read one of them? Steve. Okay. I don't think he wants to read one, Coach Claxton. We're not going to force anybody to read anything. So, who wants to read the first one? Number six. Jack's going to read it. Go, Jack. A massive 135 grams was referred to Alan as the grain to contain 30.1 times 10 to the 10 gray atoms. What is the element? Okay, so what is the element means you have to find the molar mass, as we just mentioned. I mean, that's where we want to end up with the molar mass, so we can look at the periodic table and pick the element. Okay, what we know is the little m mass, and we know the capital N number of particles. Um, and because we know Avogadro's number, you know that is the, the number of particles per mole. So we could use that to get the number of moles, right? We could say, the number of moles is equal to the 3.1 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, whatever that is, would be the number of moles. And then if you know the number of moles, you know that molar, <laughs> molar mass is little mass, 135, divided by number of moles, which is whatever that is. Five. I think, okay, that comes out to be five, so this is 135 divided by five, which apparently is 27. All right, that's how you do number six. That's, that's, Everybody see that? Okay, that one was all based on Review of chemistry from two years ago. Did we ever, we never turned this on, did we? She did. Oh, it is running. Okay. Hi, Sarah. Didn't know it was running. This is number six. Any questions about it before we move on? What do you call the ends stand for? The ends? And A is Avogadro's number, but just an N by itself is the number of particles. And that's, and that's, in that case, it's that. The little n is the number of moles. So capital N, number of particles, little n, number of moles. Because moles right? are little. Well, the particles are actually smaller than the mole is, but. Yeah, gosh. Okay, then why is the particle not the smallest? I don't know. Because people nerd has a little n, in it, <laughs> and that's because number of moles. <laughs> you learned that a year, two years ago, and you, you didn't forget it, did you? Oh, what? I wouldn't have forgotten anything. Wait, Sarah, <laughs> when you read that message, which one is right? Which which one can you read? So probably. Sophia thinks you can read that. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> and she's you know perfectly reasonable. In uh, Lucy thinks you can read that. I don't know if that's true. That's true, Lucy. Yeah. Lucy picks that one. Sophia picks that one. I'm not gonna. Jaden's been criticizing me. Even though no, I know the answer, but now I'm gonna erase that. <laughs> You want to see it ever again? You're going to have to rewind. You don't use the word rewind anymore, do you? Because that yeah, was that yeah, was we tapes. Do. We use the word. We'd actually rewind you, you, the tape. You rewind, you rewind like on YouTube. videos. You go back. Okay. Also, yeah, YouTube I mean, rewind. Oh, All right. Not going to talk about that anymore. I need somebody to read number sixteen. Who will do that? Lucy, I think. Yeah. I think that Lucy can read sixteen. Yeah, I want you to read. Why don't you just read? Right? Quit arguing. You're wasting Sarah's time. Yeah, okay. Lucy, you should do it. I feel like you should open your book. Jaden, go ahead. Jaden, you're going to read. A good year blimp typically contains 5,400 cubic meters of helium at an absolute pressure of 1.1 times 10 to the fifth pass. Wait, wait, we're going to have to reread that. Was that cubic meters of helium? Yes. Okay, what was the pressure again? 1.1 times 10 to the fifth pass. Okay. That's inside the, the Goodyear blimp. The temperature of the helium is 280 kelvins. 280 kelvins. All right. What is the mass in kilograms of the helium in the blimp? 
We want little m, that's our question, the mass in kilograms of the helium. Now, the fact that it's helium means you can look on a periodic table and know its molar mass is four. Uh, and it, it, well, it's four grams per, uh, uh, it's actually grams per milliliter. What is, what is it in milliliter. SI units? I don't know. We'll have to think about that. <coughs> Uh, okay, <coughs> so we know that because it's helium, we have all these numbers, so all these numbers remind us of PB equals NRT, and we've got the, the temperature, we've got the volume, we've got the pressure, and we know R, therefore we can use that to get N. Everybody agree with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so whatever N comes out to be is the number of moles, and if you know that, and you know the molar mass, you can get the mass because molar mass is, is mass divided by N. And that's what we're looking for. However, if that's in grams per milliliter, and that's moles, this will come out in grams. Is that really true? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I put, look, I put milliliter. It's grams per mole. That's what was wrong. That's why nothing was clicking in my head. I was just talking nonsense. Okay. All right. Now it all makes sense. It's, it's four grams per mole, and, and that's moles, and that's, so that will come out in grams. So all you'd have to do then is take your answer and convert it to kilograms, because that's what they asked for. Okay. We'll take that and divide by 1,000. Does that give you the right answer? Yeah. Because I don't know what all these numbers are. So get n that way, and then multiply n times 4. And that will give you the mass in grams, divide by 1,000 to get kilograms. Okay, that's number 16. All right, does that come out to be something close to 1,000? Okay, we are ready for number 17. Who's going to read 17? Not Jack or Jaden. I need another volunteer. Kyle, you got it. A clown at a birthday party brought along a helium cylinder. Oh, hold it. It's a clown. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Hold it. There's a clown. I don't know what a clown really looks like, but, but you know, he's got this big smile thing. He's got a big round nose. Oh, no. He's got... He's adorable. He's wearing, he's wearing some kind of hat, probably. What? He's, he's got big ears. Uh... He's, he's, you know, this guy, and he's got big, fluffy pants, and he's got giant feet. Okay, now he's got some helium balloons, is that what you said? He's got long oh, arms, he's got some kind of cylinder. Cylinder. helium cylinder. What's he got? A helium cylinder. Oh, oh there's a the cylinder. Bash. Okay, over here's a, a balloon-filling cylinder. With helium inside it. It's a cylinder. Okay. Now, go ahead. With which he intends to fill balloons. When full, each balloon contains 0 0.034 meters cubed of helium. Uh, is that cubic meters, did you say? Yes, sir. Okay. At an absolute pressure of 1.2 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Okay. The cylinder contains helium at an absolute pressure of 1.6 times 10 to the 7th pascals and has a volume of 0 0.0031 cubic meters. Wait, say that volume again. 0 0.0031 cubic meters. Okay, so that's this stuff down here is the cylinder. This up here is the balloon, right? Okay, go ahead. The temperature of the helium in the tank and in the balloons is the same and remains constant. What is the maximum number of balloons that can be filled? Okay. So to get the maximum number, here's the question, number of balloons. And so, do the balloons have two ends in it? So, two L's, rather. So, <coughs> if you want to know the maximum number of balloons, you need to find the volume that, that's going to come out of this. And then, because that's the volume of one balloon, you can divide and get the number of balloons. So we need to come up with volume What's the volume of one balloon? That's the total volume. 
What was the actual question again? How many balloons can you get from what? What is the maximum number of balloons that can be filled? Okay, from the tank. So, so um, this is the volume when the pressure is this. The volume of inside the... Is that really the volume? That's not the volume inside the tank, is it? Yeah. It is? Okay. That's the volume of the helium inside the tank when it's at high pressure. But when it goes into the balloons, it's going to be a lower pressure, and so it will be a different volume. Uh, that's just the volume of one balloon. So what we're trying to do is, is see how many of these will there be. So what I'm thinking is PV equals PV. And you could think of it that way if you want, but the temperatures are the same, so the T's go away. Um, the other thing you could have done was PV equals NRT and make up a temperature, just pretend you know it and make one up, like 20 degrees, 293, and solve for N, and then use PV equals NERT again uh, with the 20 degrees and the number in and see what the volume is at the different pressure. However, that's a lot of work. It just seems easier just to do it this way. Because uh, the N is not going to change and the T is not different. So take all that out and you've got PV uh, at one pressure has to equal PV at the other pressure. So you've got the two different pressures. Does that make sense? So I can say 1.6 times 10 to the seventh pressure times V, and that's the total volume of all the gas in the tank when you, at, at, no, we know what that is. The total volume in the tank we know is 0 0.0031. Okay, so that's the pressure and volume inside the tank right now, but that's got to equal the new pressure, 1.2 times 10 to the fifth. Uh, once it comes out of the tank, is at a much lower, much lower pressure. And so it's going to be a much greater volume. So you're going to find out what would the volume be once it comes out of a can and is in the balloons. What's the total volume? So when you solve that for V, you've got the total volume for all the balloons, whatever it is. And then see how many of these are in that. And apparently it's 12 because we know that's the answer. So you take this number and whatever that is, then you take that number and divide it by 0.034 to get 12 balloons. And probably I'm off the board. Sarah can't see that. Okay. Now, do you see what we did? Does this make sense to all of you? Um, what you learned about the ideal gas law, proof equals NERT, um, since N, R, and T are all constant, then PV before has to equal PV after. So that's kind of where we got this. So since N, R, and T are, didn't change, none of that changed when it went from the tank to the balloons. None of that changed. So PV in, in the tank has to equal PV in the balloons. Okay. Any more questions about that? Before we go into the new final thing, that is one good clown. Mm -hmm. That's a good clown. You're like a hobo. And actually, a clown also has, you know, it's got this, uh, got the big gloves. I don't think you've ever seen a clown, Coach Claxton. <laughs> you don't think I've ever seen a clown? That, no. I used to live and travel with the circus. <laughs> that's, what I, that's how I made a living from the time I was five until <laughs> I was 18. I feel like that's a lie. What? I feel like that's a lie. I don't know why. <laughs> I just realized my lie was recorded here. And it's going to be viewed, viewed by millions of people. <laughs> Probably. Millions of people, meaning one, maybe Sarah. She probably so I, can watch this later. I trust you, Sarah, that you will not spread this lie, this this lie that I was once in the circus. I was never in the circus. I don't know do. what a clown looks like. <laughs> <laughs> never even seen one. If you do, you have a trapeze artist. 
All right, we're going to, I should pause it during this duration time. Yeah. To save video time. This might stop it again. Someday, someday <laughs> YouTube's going to fill up. They won't have any more room, and you know why? Because I just jabber on forever instead of actually making good use of the time. I had a better marker. I'm going to pause it. Which one pauses it, Sophia? Okay. All right. I'm glad I paused it because there was nothing but nonsense while we were away. All right. We're, we're finishing out chapter 14 here. We're going to talk about kinetic theory. Oh, I don't think I like this marker much either. We'll stick with it. It's like sepia tone. Oh, no, it's what? It's sepia. We're sticking with it. Kinetic theory of, of ideal gases. Okay. Um, do you remember the test you just took on and question number, I think it was two or three that you all didn't like, didn't think it was fair? It was about the kinetic theory of ideal gases. And so the reason you didn't think it was fair was this is really in chapter 14. But I talked to you about how you could eliminate all the, the wrong choices and come up with the right one by process of elimination. Anyway, the kinetic theory is about what gases do on a molecular level, you know, the, the little particles. And we've talked a little about this. We talked about how pressure is the molecules bumping into the walls. That's the reason there is pressure on the inside a tank that has a gas in it. Okay, so we're, we're talking about what the molecules do. And let's start with the definition of temperature, which you already know. It's the... We've defined it as the average kinetic energy of the particles. So there are the, the molecules again that come into play. K for kinetic energy, T for temperature, and they are directly proportional. However, the definition says average kinetic energy. Why would it have to say average? Do you remember the correct answer to that question on the test? Not all the molecules are moving at the same speed. They don't all move at the same speed. So we. So that means they don't all have the same kinetic energy. So we have to get an average. And that average is directly proportional to the temperature. Uh, okay. And then don't forget that kinetic energy is one half mv squared, which you remember well from last year. And that tells us the temperature, yes, is proportional to k, but that's proportional to v squared. So this V squared is going to become important in just a few minutes. We'll come back to it. But keep in mind that the temperature is directly proportional to the speed squared. And, and it's the average. I'll put a bar over it for average uh, because it's the average kinetic energy. And, and all the molecules don't have the same velocity. Therefore, it's the average v squared. It's not the average v squared. It's the average v squared. Do you get the difference? Yes. Okay. If you could square, if you could find the speed of every molecule, but take each of those and square it. So now you've got v squared for every molecule, and then they're all different. Then get that average. That's what this is. <laughs> okay. And we're going to come back to that. That's kind of a thing that you'll need to know for your test on Tuesday. I think it's next week on Tuesday. It could be. I don't remember. I think it's next. It is probably. Okay. All right. With that in mind, without uh, deriving it any further, because that would just take time that we don't need to do, the average kinetic energy that is equal to, we turn the proportion into an equation, the fraction, I believe, is 3 halves Boltzmann constant T. And this is, this is, if you're wondering where does the 3 halves come from, where do you get Boltzmann, all that stuff, read your book. Because <laughs> it is derived nicely in chapter 14. Uh, they show you where it all comes from. I don't mean to deprive you of that, but I don't want to take the time this is on your equation sheet, this equation. Um, and it shows clearly that the temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy. 
because three halves in KB are constants. Okay, so that, and, and the T of course would be Kelvins. Uh, K would be in joules, all right. There's another part to the, this is when, it, when you ask, what, is, what does the kinetic theory say? Well, that's one thing it says. It says the average kinetic energy is directly proportional to the temperature. So that's part of the kinetic theory. The other part of the kinetic theory of gases is U. Now, you're not going to like this. You're going to be upset with what I'm about to say. Try to contain your emotion. Try to contain, Nate, try to contain your emotion. Right now, you're going to be upset. What I'm going to tell you is that you're used to U meaning potential energy, but here it's not potential energy. It's a capital U. It is total internal energy. Here, let's write that now. Total internal energy of, and so this is, we're talking about the molecules of the gas. So this is the total internal energy of the molecules of the gas. So like what? Imply which one? Total would include both K and U, or both kinetic and potential. But in this chapter, we're going to start using U to mean this. So it's not just potential. If you could add up all the kinetic energies of all the particles and all the potential energies of all the particles and any other energy that might be there and add it all up, it would be this for, for that gas that's, that's in that tank. That's what U means. Now, we're going to use that a whole lot in future chapters, like the next one. Chapter 14, you're just introduced to this, U, total internal energy. But, but you're, we're going to use that a great deal in the next couple of chapters. Anyway, to finish the kinetic theory, it's equal to 3 halves. I'm going to have to walk over and make sure this is right. I think it's 3 halves in our, in our T. Ooh, is that correct? Maybe don't write that down yet until I walk over and make sure that that's right. This is from my memory. And this equation does not happen to be on the equation sheet. So let me make sure it's right. And U equals 3 halves NRT. It is correct. Okay. All right. This is kinetic energy, average kinetic energy of the particles. This one is the total energy of all the particles and all kinds of energy uh, of, in a gas. Okay. As long as you know what the K is and what the U is, you're okay for now. Again, we're going to come back to this, and this will make more sense in, in the next chapter, than it, more than it does right now. But, right? but still, U is directly proportional to T also. You can see that. Because these are constants. That's number of moles, as long as you're not changing the amount of gas, and that's the, the gas constant, 8.31. So this is all constant, so T directly proportional to U. That's the kinetic theory of the gases in equation form. Okay. Now, we need to talk about, before we finish this little topic, we need to talk about a guy named Maxwell. His last name was Maxwell. I don't know his first name. I'm sure it's in your book. But what he decided was um, he figured out, of course, that the molecules are not all moving at the same speed. But at a certain temperature, there's, a, there's an average that's the same for all of them. Okay. So he did a lot of work without going into all his work. He made a graph that over here is the percent of molecules in the particular gas and down here is the speed okay that's V of the molecules this is the speed of, the, of each molecule okay and this is how many of them are at that speed right the y-axis percent percent of molecules that are at a given speed uh, you know for example a point right here just means there are at least some, there's this percent of molecules that are going that speed. Okay. What he got was curves that are kind of like this. Okay. And um, 
every every point on this curve represents a molecule that is um, at a certain temperature. This all all the same temperature. This entire curve represents. I think uh, your textbook has an example where it's 300 kelvins. Okay, so if you take a gas, say oxygen, and you um, and you've got speeds down here, like you know 100 meters per second and 200 and so on, uh, and, and these are the legitimate speeds. Remember, the molecules are just vibrating, even though the, in a gas they're moving like this, they're also vibrating. So. Moving from here over to there is not going 100 meters per second, but when you add in the vibrations, yeah, it is. That's how fast that molecule is actually moving. Okay, so these speeds are real high. Anyway, a gas at 300 kelvins, some of them are hardly moving at all. See how low speed that would be? Um, some of these are moving faster, higher percentage faster, but up here is the highest percentage, and, and they would have some speed that, that you could read. Um, How okay. would you do this? Now, then he took, well, what if I take oxygen and raise the temperature? What would that curve look like? So he did one that's like a thousand kelvins. And that curve still starts way over here, but it, it does more like that. Yeah, it should be a little nicer, smooth curve. But it goes a lot farther over as I hope you would expect it to be. See, this is at a thousand Kelvin. This is just my example. I don't have numbers here anyway, really. Um, but at a much higher temperature, it goes a lot farther because you, at a higher temperature, the speeds are greater. See, the molecules have to be moving faster at a thousand Kelvins. Um, but it doesn't go up as high because the speeds are still spread out from almost zero to something really fast. And if you think of the area under the curve, that should be the same for both of these because that's kind of the number of molecules. Well, kind of, it is. The number of molecules is, is the same. We, we've got the same sample of gas, it's just at a higher temperature here. So if you're going to spread out the speeds, which you do at a higher temperature, temperature, it's got to be lower so the area under the curve is the same. Anyway, these are called Maxwell's curves. Yes? How do you measure like the speed of an individual molecule? Uh, with a little tiny speedometer. <laughs> that was Axel. That was great, wasn't it? That was. I don't know. Hard. You'd have to ask Maxwell. Okay. I'll go and ask for it. Uh, there's a graph in your textbook, though, that you will see when you read this next section, if you haven't already, um, that looks kind of like this. And so this is, this is something that would, uh, these shapes are something you should be familiar with. What would you think the curve would look like if I said, well, we'll draw the curve for uh, 700 Kelvins? Something between 300 and 1,000. What do you think? The curve is still going to start way down here, but what would it do? What do you think? Would it go lower? Yeah. Higher? Would it go higher than that? What would it do? Higher than 1,000. It would go higher than that, but it would drop sooner down here. Because at, at 700, you're not going to have as high as speeds, because it's not as hot. Uh, so it's got to drop sooner, but but the area under the curve still has to be the same. The same number of molecules. Okay. That's just to get you looking at the what the curves look like and kind of understanding the graph. Uh, I've seen questions about this before on the AP exam, although it's not common. But yeah, there was one year it was in a free response question. And they... Uh, at various levels of success when they, when they dealt with it. Because we, we talk about Maxwell's curves one time, it's today. It's in your book. We probably never will bring it up again unless it's, of course, on your next test, which it could be. But, uh, but after this unit, after chapter 14, we may not ever talk about it again, yet it could be on your AP exam. So there it is, Maxwell's curves for molecules and their speeds um, 
Everything at 700 kelvins is not moving at the same speed, but you can get, you can look on the graph if you, if this was a real graph and find the highest point and, and say, well, that's where most of the molecules have their speed. But there are some that are going really slow and some going really fast. That's the idea. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. I have one final thing to teach you in the next 10 minutes. To kind of finish up chapter 14, as far as new material. And it is this idea that we mentioned a moment ago where b squared is a, is a big deal because kinetic energy is proportional to b squared and temperature is as well. All right. Because that's a big deal, when you get these graphs, which again, that was percent molecules and this was speed V, um, the speed V, Sophia asked, how did he calculate it? Probably he did it the way we're just about to talk about. Uh, but I don't know how these equations were created. However, he probably, somebody created these and he used them. This speed, remember, is what's important with temperature is V squared. But we just mentioned a, a while ago, it's actually V squared and the average of all the V squares. We talked about that just a moment ago. So if I say, if I write the word speed, but what I mean is uh, V squared, then I can put squared in front of that. Squared speed, that's V squared, but it's the average of those. So in front of that, I can write the word mean, which means average. The mean squared speed, um, but this is not V squared, it's just V. So this is actually the square root of that. <laughs> so put the word root in front of that, and you've got the term that I'm trying to come up with. The root mean square speed. That's what this is, the V down here. Okay, that means what I told you a moment ago, somebody took the speed of, of each one and squared it. So you've got all these different V squares for each molecule and they're all different. But then you took an average of all those and you got a number. And then you took the square root of that and that's, and that's equal to the V we're talking about. And it's usually written RMS for root mean square speed. Root mean squared speed, the V for speed, velocity. Okay, now I'm gonna show you how to calculate it. This is just the idea. You haven't learned how to calculate it. You can't really add up all the V squares, you know, that's, nobody knows. But nobody knows, Sophia, what the Apparently speeds are. Max was. That, but he, no, you can calculate this, but I'm about to show you how. But what's the actual speed of one molecule? You can't get that. Okay. <coughs> So I'm going to show you how to calculate it, and this equation is not on your equation sheet, although it used to be, they took it off, but you still get questions about it sometimes. And here it is, VRMS, can be calculated this way. Three, where does the three come from? There are three dimensions of space, so one third of molecules at any given time are bumping into the wall. That was made up. That was a made up statement. Those aren't words. No, those are real words. Okay. It's in your textbook. Pro I don't know if it is or not, but it's true. Okay. Three. There's a chance that's correct. I'm going to walk over here and see if it really is. There are two versions of it that I get mixed up. That's why I'm not sure. Three RT over capital M. That is correct. All right, now here's what that is. Obviously, the three is a three. R is the, is the gas constant, 8.31. Same one as, as you know. T is the temperature in Kelvin. Capital M, again, is the molar mass you can get from the periodic table. So, if you want to know what is the root mean square speed of, say, oxygen. Here's a question. Oxygen, which you know is O2. Um, at, at 20 degrees Celsius, 
I want to know how, uh, I want to know what their root mean square speed is. How fast are they moving? Keep in mind that they're all moving at different speeds. So when you get an answer, it's, it's an average. It's an average of the, of the, it's an average of the square of the speed. Okay. Well, let's plug into this. It would be the square root of three times 8.31 times 293, put it in Kelvins, divided by M. The thing about M is though for oxygen, you can look it up, it's 16, but it's O2, so what is it? 32, but you'll still get tricked if you forget, physics uses SI units for everything. 32 is in grams per mole. You got to use kilograms for physics because it's the SI unit. What would that be in kilograms? Divide by a thousand. So if you forget to, to convert it to kilograms, you'll still get a wrong answer. It's got to be kilograms. Get the number from the periodic table. If it is a diatomic molecule like oxygen, you've got to double it. 16 times 2. But then you still got to convert it to kilograms. So you have to think through the capital M. You have to think it all the way through. But if you do that, you, that will give you the right answer. And that comes out to be some big number. Like probably 500 or something. Is anybody calculating that? Kyle is. 477. 477? Okay, so 478 if you round it off. Meters per second. That's the, that's the average, but still that is a, a, that would be a speed that one molecule of O2 is, is actually vibrating when the, when the temperature is just like it is in this room right now. It's about 20 degrees in here. They're all moving at 478 meters per second. Okay. Now, and this is just for there's also nitrogen in the room. Is it moving at the same speed because it's the same temperature? This is a good concept question. Oxygen is moving at 478. Would nitrogen also? It's the same no. temperature. Would it be moving at 478? No. No, because how do you know? M. It has a different M. It has a different mass. Nitrogen uh, weighs less than oxygen. If it weighs less, would it be moving faster or slower? It would be moving faster. And, but you could calculate it, just plug in the number of M for N2 nitrogen. All right, understand how that works? Is this just for gases? This is just for gases, right? Uh, R is the gas constant, so this, right. this doesn't work for anything but gases. No point in using it for anything else. Um, I'm gonna show you, although if you don't wanna write it down, you don't have to. Here. I don't know if you'll need this for your homework or not, but there's another version of it, which is three Boltzmann constant instead of R, that the Boltzmann constant T, but it's divided by, it's divided by, what's the symbol? U? I don't know. Uh, it is the, I don't ever use this one, but it is true. I think it's a Greek letter mu, but it's molecular mass. Um, I'll put the Greek letter mu, but if, you're, if that confuses you, don't worry. It's, it's, whereas that's molar mass, capital M is molar mass, grams per mole. This one is molecular mass, which would be U, atomic mass units per mole. Well, you don't know the atomic mass units per mole, but you could calculate them. The, the problem with this one, the reason I don't ever use it, you can get you can get that number, molecular mass, from the periodic table also, but then you've got to convert it to U's. Uh, and it's annoying. No, no, then that would be U's. You've got to convert that to kilograms. That's what I should tell you. U's are from the, yeah, U's come from the periodic table, but then you got to convert that to kilograms, which means you need to know that one U is 1.66 times 10 to the 19th or whatever it is. I don't remember, I have to look it up, but it's on your 
constant page. You can see why I never use that version of it. I don't even know it. You got to convert that to kilograms because that's the SI unit. Everything in here has got to be SI units. So converting that to kilograms is, is even trickier than this. That's why I don't ever use that one, but it's still there. Okay. That's all that's in chapter 14. Our test is scheduled for Tuesday. You're going to have homework tonight that's due Friday because we don't meet tomorrow. Um, and then you'll have homework for Monday. And then the test is Tuesday. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn you off. Thanks, Sarah, for watching. Uh, okay. Bye.